Atomic Heart's story is complex, convoluted, and confusing. It'll throw a twist at you, then a bit later throw a counter twist that contradicts the earlier twist, and then later a counter counter twist that contradicts everything else, even though you didn't really understand the first two twists anyway. The story is so confusing that it can be hard to tell who even is the true villain of this game. Well, after going over it all, I think there are three separate antagonists in this game. All three of them commit equally revolting crimes. All three of them are working against each other, and all three of them believe they are doing what is right, even if their moral compasses are pretty twisted. The three antagonists of Atomic Heart are Viktor Petrov, Dmitry Sessionov, and Cheriton Zakharov. So let's look at them. First is Viktor Petrov. So who the heck is Viktor Petrov? What evil heinous acts does he commit and why? Viktor Petrov is a brilliant roboticist working at Facility 3826. Facility 3826 is the setting of the game. In this alternate history where a flourishing Soviet Union has developed incredible technological breakthroughs, Facility 3826 is their premier research center. The labs here and the scientists who manned them conduct incredible research in a wide variety of fields. In this community of ultra smarty pants, Viktor Petrov had some of the smartest pants around. He started his career in the theater, where he revolutionized ballet by replacing human ballerinas with android ballerinas, who were more graceful and skilled than their human counterparts could ever dream of being. His work in the theater got him noticed by the higher-ups at Facility 3826, and he soon became the head of the robotics laboratory. It's likely that he had a hand in developing just about every single robot you encounter throughout the game. And since all of these robots are completely amazing, Viktor Petrov must be pretty amazing too. But there's a dark side here. All of the robots you encounter throughout the game are supposed to be non-threatening, peaceful worker robots. Obviously, judging by all the dead bodies and all the robots wielding machine guns and laser cannons, these robots are not what they are advertised to be. They are murder robots pretending to be gardening robots. Viktor Petrov tries to punt the responsibility for the deadly robots elsewhere. But the truth is, as head of robotics, he absolutely must have had a hand in developing these secret murder robots. And so any violent human deaths that result are at least partly his responsibility. But developing secret murder robots isn't Viktor Petrov's greatest sin. You can find notes throughout the facility describing his personality. He is described as theatrical, dramatic, extremely egotistical, and irrationally jealous of others' accomplishments. Surrounded by the greatest thinkers of his age, Petrov desired to be considered just as great, if not greater, than them to be given infinite resources to prove his brilliance, to be given everything he thought he deserved, which was everything. Of course, he was very accomplished. His accomplishments led to him being appointed to the core team of elite scientists developing Collective 2.0. Okay, so what the heck is Collective 2.0? Collective 1.0, the earlier version, was a network in which all robots were connected together. Any single robot could coordinate with every single other robot in the network simultaneously, able to share information to work together. This made robots dramatically more efficient. Collective 2.0 is the human version of that network. Collective 2.0 is meant to allow humans to, using a thought device worn on the forehead, mentally connect to the robot network. Connected to this network, you could control the robots with your thoughts. The robots themselves could share information with you. All information stored on the network would be available to you, could be downloaded directly to your brain. You could learn anything instantly. But Collective 2.0 doesn't just connect you with the robots on the network. It also connects you with all other humans connected to the network. You can share ideas instantly. You can communicate instantly. If you and I were both connected to Collective 2.0, we could know everything about each other. All of my experiences would be yours. All of my talents would be yours. All of my skills would be yours. Everything I've ever learned, every hard lesson learned through mistakes, every book I've read, every thought I've had, every memory would be yours, and yours mine. 
Collective 2.0 would put us all on an absolutely equal footing. This would be a world without individual talent or genius. Everyone would be a genius. Everyone would be a master of every known discipline. Any new idea could be shared and known across the network as soon as it was discovered. The word collective is related to collectivism, which is a word you've probably heard associated with communism. Collectivism is a way to organize society as opposed to individualism. In individualism, individuals work for themselves, to benefit themselves, to gain greater access to necessities and luxuries for themselves. In collectivism, the individual works for the collective, works to the benefit of everyone, so everyone can gain equal access access to necessities and luxuries. Historical attempts at collectivist organized societies on a national scale have not been very successful. Truly equal access to necessities and luxuries has never really been achieved anywhere, because humans are selfish. But in Collective 2.0, it wouldn't matter how selfish you are. Collective 2.0 is not material collectivism, it is neurological collectivism. You aren't sharing your labor, you are sharing your thoughts, your ideas, your experiences. It is collectivism taken to a telepathic extreme. I've seen some people describe Collective 2.0 as a hive mind, and that's not totally accurate. In a hive mind, each individual shares one mind, a single mind. There is really only one individual with many bodies. In Collective 2.0, each individual shares everyone's minds. You are still an individual, but you have access to everyone else's knowledge, thoughts, and experiences whenever you want them. However, just like every other attempt at collectivism in history, everyone will not be equal in Collective 2.0. There are such things as alpha, beta, and gamma connectors, and those who possess these different connectors will have different levels of control over the network or independence from the network. There is a mind control aspect here. Whoever possesses the single alpha connector will be able to control every mind connected to Collective 2.0. Furthermore, connection to Collective 2.0 will not be a choice. Your mind will be connected whether you want to or not. Your mind will be controlled by whoever possesses the alpha connector whether you want to or not. So let's get back to Viktor Petrov. Viktor Petrov, murder robot aficionado, was horrified by Collective 2.0. He foresaw a future in which every human in the world would become a mind drone, controlled by whoever wielded the Alpha Connector. In order to prevent this, he tried to warn the world what was happening, to share these secrets with the Soviet Union's enemies. In order to do that without being caught or stopped, he needed a distraction. He needed time. So he triggered the combat mode of every supposedly peaceful robot in Facility 3826, designated everyone but himself and his accomplice as enemies. The robots of Facility 3826 violently slaughtered almost every single person working there. Thousands of people, if not tens of thousands. And every single one of those deaths was caused by Viktor Petrov. Viktor tries to defend himself by saying that he's not the one in charge. He didn't make the decision to turn supposedly peaceful robots into secret murder robots. That order came down from above. He just triggered in the Soviet Union what the Soviet Union had intended to trigger elsewhere. These peaceful robots were supposed to be sold or donated to the United States States, where they would violently take over nuclear facilities, and thus the country, in an operation codenamed Atomic Heart. He claims that he had to launch all of the robots in Facility 3826 into a bloody killing spree to stop the launch of Collective 2.0, to save humanity. After all, what are a few thousand lives when compared to the entire human race? Petrov is ultimately hunted down by our protagonist for what he did. He commits suicide, and that's the end of his story. It's it's up to the player to judge whether Viktor Petrov was right or wrong. Is stopping Collective 2.0 worth all this death and destruction? Is Collective 2.0 really all that bad? Will humanity actually be enslaved by the holder of the Alpha Connector? Was there really no other way for Petrov to do this? None of these questions have solid answers. It's a basic question of morality. Do the ends justify these horrific means? Now it's time to move on to our second antagonist, Dmitry Sessionov. Dmitry Sessionov is the head of Facility 3826, the creator of Collective 2.0, the holder of the Alpha Connector that could allow him to enslave humanity if he was so inclined. He's also our main character's boss. P3, the character we control, is obsessed with Sechenov. Sechenov saved his life, and P3 is so 
so grateful that he's willing to do anything Sechenov says and believe anything Sechenov tells him. Throughout the game, our protagonist is confronted by mounting evidence of Sechenov's treachery, and because of P3's thick skull and absurd loyalty, he just refuses to believe most of it. But let's get into some backstory. Dmitry Sechenov began his marvelous scientific career with the discovery of polymer. Polymer is all over the place in Facility 3826. It's this plastic jelly substance with plants growing out of it. All of the Soviet Union's incredible scientific achievements in this alternate history were powered by polymer. I don't know what the heck polymer actually is, because as far as I can tell, the game never really explains anything about it. I think it's just magic jelly that lets you do anything, basically. Sechenov discovered it, or developed it, or something, and that makes him pretty much the most important person in the world. He created Facility 3826. He is personally responsible for all of its achievements. All of the robots, the polymer, the flying cities, Collective 1.0 and 2.0, the crazy plant zombies, it's all on him. So yeah, he's amazing. He's also responsible for all the messed up stuff that Facility 3826 has produced. These secret murder robots the Soviet Union were going to use to take over the world. The Alpha Connector that will allow him to control Collective 2.0. He made this weird red polymer jelly man that can absorb people's consciousness. He is the one who erased P3's mind after a terrible accident, though he claims he did this for P3's sake to help him. He claims P3 is like a son to him, but then at the end he sends his sexy ballerina robot bodyguards to kill him. He took P3's dead wife's mind and stuck it in these two sexy ballerina robot bodyguards, though he claims he did that in an attempt to save her life. But I mean, dude, don't put my wife's brain in your sexy ballerina robots. That's weird. That's crossing a line. He probably murdered Cheriton Zakharov, then definitely preserved Zakharov's memories and personality in this little jelly, and claims he did that to save his best friend's life. I have an explanation for Zakharov's murder, but I'll get to it later. A lot of of what Sechenov does throughout the game is confusing. The twists are muddled and convoluted, but they don't really matter. What about Collective 2.0? That's the big one. That's the big sin. The enslavement of all humanity. In one of these bizarre limbo sections, you can hear Sechenov speaking. He talks about democracy and communism these two flawed forms of government. He says that while both forms of government promise equality, neither actually delivers on this promise. In both democratic and communist nations, inequality is rampant. He says he wants to do away with all human and social systems, all governments, because they are flawed. With Collective 2.0, he can make all humans truly equal. Government won't matter anymore. When all knowledge is equal, then all people can be equal, or at least so Sechenov believes. If not knowledge is power and all knowledge is shared equally, then power will automatically be shared equally too. Society will change in ways we can't even imagine. The progress of science will rapidly advance. Collective 2.0 could be the next step in human evolution. All that came before, all our ideas of government, all our ideas of how to organize society will be made irrelevant. When all people everywhere, every human being is connected, can all speak the same language, can all know each other's experiences as if you experience experience them for yourself. Governments will go extinct. Nations will go extinct. There will only be humanity. But what about that Alpha Connector? The one that will give Sechenov personal control over the network. Sechenov claims that he will only use the Alpha Connector to help guide humanity to its next phase. Once humanity is settled into its new stateless, ultra-equal mind-sharing state, he claims he will destroy the Alpha Connector and allow humanity to freely evolve in whatever directions humanity will go. This mirrors socialist theory. Socialist theorists have acknowledged that to transition directly from a capitalist individualist society into a communist collectivist society is probably impossible. It's just too dramatic a change to occur naturally. Their solution is for a group of benevolent leaders to take control of society, to guide the transition from individualism to collectivism, and then to relinquish that control once the collectivist society is ready to stand on its own, to begin an age of true equality. Historically, that relinquishing of control never happens. In Russia, in the October Revolution of 1917, a group of leaders of pretty questionable benevolence did take control of society, did guide or for 
force, a transition into a form of collectivism. But they never gave up that control. The Soviet Union, for its entire 70-year history, was always ruled by autocratic leadership. It is not human nature to give up power. You can find relatively few examples throughout history of individuals who were willing to give up total power. For Sechenov to give up that power, he would have to truly be a saint, one of the greatest men who ever lived. Even if he really does intend to give up that power, even if he really believes he would give up that power, when the decisive moment actually arrives, even he doesn't know what choice he would make. None of us really know what kinds of choices we'd be willing to make until we're actually there, in the moment, with the choice in front of us, until it's actually real. Would such an be willing to give up total power? Is Collective 2.0 really the right path forward for humanity? Can we brush aside Sechenov's other sins? The creation of the murder robots, the plans to use them to take over the world, the horrific human testing that takes place in Facility 3826, the murder of Zakharov, the wiping of P3's memories, putting his dead wife's brain in his sexy ballerina robot bodyguards. This is, I think, a weakness in Atomic Heart's writing. Sechenov is an ambiguous character, and that would be fine. I'm totally cool with ambiguity in writing, but too much of that ambiguity comes from a lack of objective information. By the end of the game, I feel like I don't know almost anything about Sechenov. I don't know his character. I don't know his nature. We don't spend enough time with him, and even when we are, I have no clue when he's telling the truth. So much of what he does feels random. There is such a thing as being too ambiguous in a story. And speaking of things that are way too ambiguous, let's move on to our third antagonist, Cheriton Zakharov. Who is Cheriton Zakharov? I have no idea. There is very little information about this guy in the game. You do spend the whole game with him. He's the voice in your glove. He talks constantly, but you can't trust anything he says. He's a madman. He's genocidal. He's freaking crazy. So here's what we know about him for sure. He was a brilliant scientist, one of the top scientists at Facility 3826. He worked on Polymer. He worked on the Atomic Heart Project. He worked on Collective. He was Sechenov's partner. Sechenov describes him as his best friend. He is also described as a misanthrope, as an asshole. He didn't like people, he wasn't friendly. He died under mysterious circumstances. His consciousness was absorbed by this red polymer. Sechenov then implanted Zakharov's consciousness into this little ball of goo, then put that glue in a mechanical glove, then gave that glove to P3 for some reason. Zakharov then spends the entire game convincing P3 to kill Sechenov. Again, for some reason. Revenge, I guess? It's hard to tell when he's telling the truth. He has a single specific objective throughout the game. The death of Sechenov and a merger with the Red Polymer. And he's very willing to lie and manipulate to achieve that goal. I think we only see him being absolutely honest and truthful once in the entire game. And that's at the very end. But let's look at his death. All evidence points to Sechenov murdering his best friend. But why? Well, I think I know why. Zakharov was already dying. Look at this email message written by Zakharov. He tells Sechenov that he does not want to prolong his life. It's not explicit, but I think this suggests that Zakharov was ill, mortally ill, but he had chosen not to undergo treatment. He had chosen to accept his death. Sechenov could not accept this. He could not let his friend die. So he shoved his best friend into this red polymer which then absorbed Zakharov's consciousness, allowing him to live on in a polymer form, against his wishes. Then Zakharov, who had always thought very poorly of his fellow men, thought humans greedy and selfish and stupid and short-sighted, thought them lesser than himself, discovered that in this new polymer form, he was powerful. He had new abilities that no human could possess. He began to believe himself the next stage of humanity's evolution, greater than his creators, above human morality or ethics. To cement all of this information, I want to watch Atomic Heart's ending, and I want to look at it through a specific lens. As you watch, think of Sechenov and Zakharov as two men with competing visions of humanity's future. Both of them view humanity as flawed. Both see a need for evolution, for transformation, for humanity to take on a new, more perfect form. But their understandings of humanity's flaws are different. Sechenov believes it is the social systems that hold humanity back, the forms of government, the organization of society. He believes that if you remove those, if you establish true equality, humanity can then thrive. 
Zakharov believes the problem is much deeper and more intimate. The problem is humanity itself, human nature. Humans are greedy and stupid. Humans deserve death, deserve extinction, so that something new can thrive in its place. Okay, so let's watch the ending through that lens of understanding. Boss? Protect. Well, Cheriton, are you proud of yourself? You, Larissa, and Zenaida have certainly been busy. But, Sergei, I wouldn't have expected you to be quite so gullible, my boy. Silence! You messed with my head. You wiped my memory. Am I a toy to you like those other people connected to Collective? Who the fuck Calm do you down, think you Sergei. are? Sergei. I can see you're terribly upset. It's okay, I don't blame you. But you, Cheriton. You were supposed to help the boy, not pull his strings like a puppet. Me? Don't you blame this on me! I'm not the one trying to deprive everyone of their free will, turning them into mindless puppets. And it wasn't my choice to be a talking pile of goo, either. You're glad it happened, aren't you? You'll use everything and everyone to achieve your goal, including me and your agent. Admit it! How dare you! I lost you both. Then saved your lives. You're both scientific miracles. You were... You are my best friend, Sheraton. And the Major is like a son to me. And those two are like daughters, right? And everyone you're going to connect to Collective, everyone whose minds you're going to control, who are they to you? Millions of foster kids? Everyone is just grist for your mill, Dimitri. I want to give mankind a spectacular future. Unimaginable achievements! I want to give them a path to the star. Both of you, shut up! Get your hands up! Some goddamn wizard you are. Tell him to stand down. I'm counting to three. One! What a shame. Two! It's a shame you've escalated this situation without even trying to resolve it peacefully. But I won't let you stand in the way of progress. Right, left, terminal. The first line that sticks out to me is when Sechenov says, Cheriton, you were supposed to help the boy. It sounds like the reason Sechenov gave P3 the Zakharov glove is because Zakharov had claimed he would try to help P3 in some way. Instead, Zakharov spent all of his time trying to manipulate P3 into killing Sechenov, since in his polymer form, he couldn't kill Sechenov himself. Zakharov is a liar, a manipulator. He doesn't just manipulate P3, he's been manipulating Sechenov from the beginning, too. I do think Sechenov's claim that he saved both Zakharov and P3's lives rings true emotionally. I think he really does believe he saved their lives. The problem is, what form has that life taken? P3 is alive, but he's lost all memory of his past life. He has serious psychological damage. He is controlled by Sechenov. Zakharov is technically alive, but only as a pile of goo. And furthermore, Sechenov made these choices for them. P3 didn't choose to live on in this form and neither did Zakharov. Sechenov chose that for them, for his own sake, because emotionally he couldn't stand to let them go. Sechenov is an inherently selfish character, and he can't even tell when he's being selfish. I also think he sounds genuine when he says he wants to give humanity a greater future, but again, he's the one choosing the form that future will take. He's going to hook everyone up to Collective. He is going to transform human society and consciousness, whether they want it or not. He's not letting anyone choose choose their own fates. He claims that P3 is like a son to him, but then look how coldly Sechenov orders his death, how dismissive he is, how he just sits down at his desk and gets back to work. What's he gonna do? File his taxes while his supposed adopted son is being gutted 10 feet away from him? In the same room? Sechenov claims to care, but he is selfish. Sechenov claims to want to grant humanity a great future, but only a future of his own choosing. Sechenov claims P3 is his son, but he's very willing to kill his own son. I've seen some people say that Sechenov isn't a villain at all, that it's really Zakharov who's the bad guy, but no, I disagree. Sechenov is a villain, he's a bad guy. After the final boss fight, this cutscene continues, and this is where things get really crazy, so let's watch it. You lousy you piece don't of shit! Cheriton's manipulating you! He gained access to the Voskhod module in your brain and started sending you to limbo. 
I was busy getting ready for the collective update, so I didn't realize it right away. He's the one who killed Molotov. Tell me, Cheriton, did you do the same thing to Dr. Volatova? <laughs> did you use my agent to tear her limb from limb? I'm sick of your hypocrisy, Dimitri. I did your dirty work while you stayed squeaky clean. But they didn't deserve to die. Why have you done this? <clears throat> you motherfucker this whole time. I've been quite uh, enough of you, Major. Uh, your job is done. Uh, uh. P3, my boy. Get up. Get up! What do you want? I want all this to end, Dimitri. I want your pathetic human race to realize it has no future. It's time for it to step aside and make way for the next phase of its evolution. What are you going to do to humanity and collective? You should not call something evil just because you cannot comprehend it. Evil is an abstract concept, and your thinking is limited. You are a human, a species that will soon be extinct. I realized when I stopped being human myself. Your limitations prevent you from seeing the truth. Dumb humans don't want to evolve. All they want is comfort and satisfaction on someone else's dime. You never wanted to join with the massive array. No. No. Don't, no. no. I After being shot, Sechenov reveals that Zakharov has been sending P3 into limbo, during which P3 unconsciously descends into homicidal rages. It happens a couple times in the game, first when he kills Molotov and later when he kills Filatova. Zakharov is responsible for those deaths. He has been manipulating P3 and murdering people this whole time. To be frank, this is bad writing. It makes no sense why Sechenov would wait until after he's been shot to reveal this. There's no reason not to reveal this information much, much earlier. Except that the story requires P3 to not know how villainous Sakharov truly is until it's too late. And it's only too late because Sechenov inexplicably turns into a moron at the very end. But whatever. What happens next is still pretty interesting. This is the only time Zakharov is being truly honest in the game. Zakharov wants evolution. The human race is flawed, weak, but the human race has created something greater than itself, polymer-based life forms. Zakharov, in his new polymer form, believes himself the next phase of human evolution. Now that humanity has created its superior successor, he believes it is time for humanity to cease to exist. Humanity has has no purpose now, they'll only get in his way. He merges with the red polymer, which is the polymer with the ability to move around on its own, the ability to absorb consciousness. There is some truth to his words. Humans don't care about evolution. Most of us don't care about progressing the welfare of the entire species. We care about fulfilling our own needs. We care about living life as comfortably and pain-free as we can, both for ourselves and the people around us we care about. 
However, for all his delusions of grandeur, there is something that Zakharov gets wrong. He is still human. His new physical form may be something greater than a human's body, but his mind, his consciousness, is still human. His thinking is still just as flawed as the rest of us. His thoughts are still just as greedy and selfish and twisted as any other murderer. He hasn't transcended human morality just because he's made of jelly. His thoughts are still human thoughts, and his crimes are still human crimes. Thank you.